So, Helena, so, um, maybe you should, could start by explaining more about your childhood and before the war. Yes. Yes, I, even though I was born in Krakow, uh, we lived in a place called Zalesztyki, which was on the, I don't know, on the map yet there. Um, it was very, very much closer to Romania. It was all the way down. And um, we had a wonderful little town called Zalesztyki, which was almost completely surrounded by water. And my mother was very happy about that because uh, she was a champion swimmer. So she could go water skiing and swimming and, and boating. And I had a little paddle, which you know I, I used with her. We, we used to go spend a lot of time on the beach because uh, the weather in Zalesztyki was very hot in the summer, very cold in the winter. So in the winter, everything was frozen over. So my mother taught me to skate when I was five. She was into every sport imaginable. Uh, she also um, was a wonderful knitter, and the, the, the clothes that we had, the hats, everything was knitted by her. Um, in addition to that, she knitted for my Shirley Temple doll. So we used to spend time with her. It was a wonderful time. Now, at six and a half uh, September, um, the war broke out. We knew that the Russians were coming and were going to take over that part of Poland. Uh, I was six and a half, so I, the political part I didn't know about, but I did know that uh, the other part of Poland was going to be overrun by the Germans, and that that meant that my grandparents, my aunt and uncles were all over there, and we were in the Russian part. Um, because the Russians were coming, the men, were very worried because uh, in the previous First World War, the men were conscripted into the Russian army, which meant 20 years hard labor. Uh, they wouldn't, I mean, they wouldn't let them out, so they had to stay in the army. So the men particularly were very concerned, and uh, without much planning or thinking, a lot of them just decided to go over to Romania. We had a nice bridge going over there, and Romania was not going to be uh, taken over, so my father went along with the, <coughs> with the others. Uh, some people took uh, families with them, but my father was afraid to take us because I had a baby sister. She was just two months old. So we remained, and my father went over, and the Russians came, took over the whole part of that po Poland, they pilfered, they, they, they did bad things, but as I said, I was a child, so I, I wasn't told much. All I know that is we quietly, we just stayed at home. Um, and we, um, we awaited some news. We didn't know, didn't know what was going to happen. We had no, no reason, we, we had no idea what was going on. Uh, but in the meantime, as it got colder and everything froze over, the people who ran away so quickly without thinking much or planning decided that maybe they should creep back on and come back because uh, they left families and businesses and so they decided that they may be, do better to, to, to see if they quietly come back. And my father with the others would creep over the frozen river and um, Unfortunately, the Russians had sealed the border, and uh, they caught them all, and they put them in prison, and they uh, accused them of being spies, and they put them on trial. And my father got 20 years hard labor in the Gulag, and he was uh, sent to Russia, to Siberia, a place called Arhangelsk, which was a Gulag, and so we lost him again. And uh, we remained at home. Um, the German, the, the, the Russians, Russians, the Russians uh, had a law that if one person in the family was a criminal, my father, the dentist, quote unquote, he was a, he was a criminal because he was sentenced. Um, then the family had to be taken to Siberia as well. So we were all packed, ready to be picked up but for some reason they didn't take us. And uh, we wondered what was happening, but they, they said that we couldn't stay in a house. I mean, it was too much to have a house. 
So they threw us out, and they threw us out to a little town just up the road called uh, Tusta. And uh, that's where we spent the, the rest of the Russian occupation, which was about a year and a half or so. My mother did manage. After one year, the, there was some communication with my father, so she knew where he was in Arhangelsk, um, and they had a couple of communications. And then one afternoon, one evening, the, the, suddenly the, the Russians disappeared, and um, we uh, were told that they left and the Germans were coming. And uh, so we went back to our house, settled back in, and waited for the Germans to come and occupy us. And did you, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, yes. but when, when you heard that the Germans were coming, yes. did, did you have, or did you, do you know that your mother had an impression of how that might be different, if that might be, did she think it might be better or worse, or? Well, all we knew was that, that we could go back to our home, right. because, you know, and, and we did not know anything at all about what, what the Germans were about. Okay, nothing and so then? Until, absolutely nothing. Okay. We, we just waited and in fear and, and worried what, what the next occupiers will do. And so how was that? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they arrived at, with big fanfare, lots of noises, and uh, came on motorcycles, you know, black uniforms, gold buttons, and tall black boots, shiny, and I was standing there watching them come down the road. Very frightening. Yeah. Um, and as I said, nobody, nobody knew what to expect. We were all ready to cooperate, just to, 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 to live in peace. Um, they started with the very strict rules, particularly for the Jews. Uh, first of all, no, schools, no school for Jewish children. Now, I was lucky, lucky because my father had taught me to read uh, before the war because he wanted me to know how to read when I went to kindergarten. So I was supposed to be a, a, you know, a very clever girl. So I was supposed to read the newspaper. I, I don't remember any of it. My mother told me that it wasn't easy because it wasn't easy to pupil, but I have no memory. All I know is that I've always, all my life, known how to read Polish to this day. Because so, of him and him making sure. Yes, 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 yes. So, um, so she kept up my skills as best as she could, looking after my, my sister, and we waited to see what else. The other thing they had very strict rules was a curfew. Uh, we had a very strict ration, food ration, very little food, and the Jewish rations were much smaller than the others. Uh, we had uh, the, the, the yellow stars on the, on the houses and yellow stars on arms if we were out. And um, we were, uh, every Jewish person was supposed to, had to work for the Germans. So uh, everybody got the job. My mother, they had a list of the Jewish community there. And they, my, they knew my mother could knit very well, so they gave her the job of knitting for the mayor, who was obviously German. He had lots of children. So my mother was told she would be knitting for the mayor of the town's children. And everybody cooperated. Um, they um, did give various jobs to people. As I said, everybody had to be working. If there wasn't a job, they, they made them clean the sidewalks. Uh, and what they did was they um, created a, a sort of a, 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 a committee, committee of the Jewish leaders in the community there. And uh, they demanded various groups of people for various jobs. They didn't want to have the trouble to looking for people, so they would just demand a group of people for jobs and to be taken out in the morning, and they would bring them back in the afternoon. So that went on for a little while, and everybody, as I said, was very cooperative. And um, then they decided there was a very big job to be done. As I said, the weather was very, very harsh in the winter, so they said that they needed the young people to come and help bind trunks of trees for the winter. And just up the road was an old military camp and the young trees, and so that they wouldn't freeze, you had to bind the trunks for the winter with uh, burlap. And uh, so they collected all the people in the square and they were walking them up the road, up, up to that uh, uh, camp. Uh, a lot of young people actually 
came along willingly just to be able to, just to help. And um, as usual, we waited for them to come back. And nobody was coming back. So all day, and afternoon, evening, nobody was coming back. We didn't know what was happening. Everybody got very anxious, didn't know what to think. And uh, nobody came. Uh, later on in the evening, one man brought, managed to get himself back. And he had been shot. He was shot. They missed his heart and they shot in, him in the arm. And he told us what actually happened. Well, when, they get, when they got to the forest there, they found there was an open grave with planks over it. They were told to undress lay on the planks, and they were shot. And as they were shot, they dropped into the, into the grave. Now, this man was one of the last ones. So, as I said, they missed his heart. And he was laying on top of the grave. Um, they didn't cover them very well. They didn't care much. And he managed to drag himself out and came back and, as I said, told us the story. And at this point, everybody realized what the plan was. And the first thing everybody did was to start looking for hiding places. And um, the next time, you know, when they were going to ask for a group of people, everybody was going to scatter. And when they did come with a request this time, they said it was going to be a uh, working in Germany, and that was common for the Polish people. They always needed workers, but nobody believed them anymore. And so everybody scattered, as I said. And my mother took my sister and me to a lady who used to cook for us, and we stayed with her the whole day. Uh, but we knew this was not the end, and this, so they, they managed to find the, the group of people that they needed, and they always had the numbers, you know, Germans like numbers. So they um, loaded them on the train and then took them away, and they were to be heard from again. And we were just so, so anxious, we didn't know, my mother didn't know what to do, two children and nowhere to hide, nowhere to go. A lot of talk about trying to get over the river to Romania, but everything was impossible. Um, and we worried that, you know, that they will continue that, but in the end, they were too clever. They, they decided that instead of trying to find us again, because the community was not that big, Instead of looking for us, they just threw the rest of us out of the town altogether. And they told us to go the same place that we were during the Russian occupation, Twister. So everybody took their whatever they could and we went over to Twister. We were told to go into a certain area, sort of communal homes, where they made us join. And uh, we uh, were told that this was going to be the area we were supposed to be, and we were not allowed to go anywhere else. But they did not. It became a ghetto afterwards. But at that point, we were just we just got a certain area where we were supposed to be. And again, the small rations and no 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 school. And the first thing you know, we started looking for was another hiding place. Uh, and my mother said to me, you know, they're not going, this is not going to work because uh, they're going to do it again. They're going to kill as many as they can and they're going to move us up again. In fact, they didn't do that exactly, but they did, uh, but they did demand again a group of people to go work in Germany again. And um, oh, my mother, uh, took us to a couple of farmers. You see, she knew some people there because we had been there before. And so she split us up. She gave, uh, gave me to one farmer, and she herself went to another farmer with my sister to stay the day whilst they were looking for people to take away. And um, all the day, I, all day long, I was waiting and, and for, thinking, you know, my mother was caught. The woman who had me, she kept telling me who was found in the square. They used to find them and put people in the square until I had the right number. 
and uh, I th kept asking her, my mother, no, not your mother, but this person, and I knew everybody, of course. Uh, no, my mother was not, not apparently caught. And that after a whole day of this, um, I waited and my mother did come to get me. And the first thing she said is, you know, I thought you were, be, you caught, you were caught. We are ne never going to split up again. Whatever happens, we go, the three of us will go together. And um, we went back to our place and again started thinking what could be done, what could she do, there's nothing to be done. She had these two kids and didn't know what to do. Um, and then they came up with this idea that we were three females, so they couldn't check. And she thought maybe because we didn't look Jewish, uh, maybe we could get away with pretending to be Catholic, and maybe we could survive that way. So they went to a priest in, in Twista, and um, they managed to obtain, they, they had to pay for the papers, but they obtained new IDs for us. Now to this day, I don't know if those papers were real or not, if they were genuine, but that was what we could get. And my mother sat me down and told me that my new name, my new grandparents, my new birthplace, and we became, I think, from Grodno instead of, instead of Krakow. And um, my sister was too young, of course, so we didn't say anything to her. And we, my mother chose a town. We were going to go away, uh, a place called Yaroslav. Now, Yaroslav was about halfway down up to Krakow. There was no particular reason, didn't know the town. But a friend were very good to us and they helped my mother and they collected a little money for us because we had none. <laughs> and uh, they put us on the train to go to Yaroslav. Can I, can I interrupt for one sec? Your friends, were they friends, Jewish friends in the ghetto yes. there too? Yes. They were all coming together to support you three and put you on your way. Yes. That's incredible. Yeah. I'm sorry to, yeah. I don't want to ruin your flow. Yeah, but no, they did not survive, by the way. Oh. The people, the so people they really sacrificed us, a lot. They were wonderful to us, yes. Yeah, that is wonderful. Um, yeah, so we were supposed to be on the train for four days and four nights. And uh, we said goodbye, and all we had left in the world, of course, was the suitcases of, uh, one or two suitcases of clothing and the uh, little money they collected for her. And as we started um, on the travel, there was a young man who attached himself to us and started chatting, as they usually do in the train. You know, you sit down and you start talking if you're in the same place. And um, my mother was talking very nicely with him, and you know, I didn't pay much attention, but then she said to me, you know, they asked, he asked many, many questions, and they were very, very hard, and they finally pushed me so hard that I could not, could not withstand it, and I admitted to him that we were actually Jewish. Because they were asking, you know, maybe grandparent, maybe maybe some uncle or something. It was enough for the Germans, you know, if there was one member of the family who was Jewish. But, it, you know, she just told them straight out that we were actually Jewish. So he said to her this. He said, I'm going to Yaroslav as well. So I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to um, watch you and travel with you to Yaroslav, and when we get to Yaroslav, I will have to, to uh, hand you over to the Gestapo. Now, my mother knew what that meant, particularly that the children would not be, would not survive because the children would be killed. And she might have been able to survive as a worker because they kept adults for work, but she did not want to survive. She told me, I don't want to survive without the kids. So we started traveling, and my mother, you know, did thinking as much as she could, and we talked a little bit, and she said, there's really nothing that we can do. And um, she said, in the end, she said she came to one conclusion. She had this one resolution that she thought would be the easiest 
and she explained to me that uh, she offered him, she gave him the tickets for the suitcases and the little nanny she had, and she even promised him the coats on her backs. And she said all she wanted him to do was to, when he gave us up to the Gestapo, to have us shot quickly, immediately. All three of you. Because she felt that this would be the least suffering for us. They do it fast. And she, as I said, she explained to me that, that there was no way, no, no way, no way to go and no way to escape. So we continued traveling like that. You can imagine four days and four nights on a train. Those trains were not very modern. And we were all exhausted, full of lice. I had hair and clothes, everything was full of lice. And um, we got very tired and, and as I said, we weren't thinking very, at least I wasn't. And then when we finally arrived in Yaroslav, as we were coming down to the platform, I suddenly woke up and I started pulling at my mother and I said, Mom, I don't want to die. And uh, she looked at me and looked at him and, uh, and we're walking towards the Gestapo and she said to him, you know, maybe you can let her go. She's blonde and green-eyed, maybe she can survive. And I said, no, I'm not going without you. So we continued our walk <coughs> to the Gestapo. And then she asked him if he had children of his own. And he said he did. So she said, look, I've given you everything I have. Keep it. Why don't you let us go and try our luck? And why do you want us on your conscience? And I think that's what actually did it. He, uh, he stopped and he said, you don't have a chance. But he left us took everything and went. So he... But there were, were the three of us, homeless, and, you know. Right. What do you do? In, in the middle, yes, ask me what we did. Well, my mother was always thinking. So she looked around, it was a little street there, sort of the main street, actually, of that little town, and she saw a little cafe. So we walked into the cafe, and she asked for a little milk for my sister. And she started asking people there if there was anybody who knew any, any place where we could find lodgings. It was very important not to be on the street because there were, there were German soldiers, you know, with guns drawn walking around and they would probably ask for the papers, but the papers we weren't sure about. So my mother was very anxious not to be outside, not to be on the not street. So uh, somebody in the place knew somebody. They said they will take us to to a place not too far away. There was a washerwoman who took lodges. So, um, so he said he'd walk us over there, which he did. And we walked in and there was this very nice lady, very, very sweet lady there. And um, she looked at us and she, my mother hurrying my, my, you know, carrying my sister and me by the hand and she said, uh, Okay, I'll, I'll take you, because my mother told her we had no money. She's going to go to work the next day, and she'd bring whatever she earns to her for keeping us. And her big son, she had two strapping sons, and they said, don't take her, Mom, don't take her. And she said, oh, no, she said, this is a mother and two children. I have to take her. So I said this was the most Christian thing you could imagine. She said that, and she took us. And uh, my mother, the next day, went to work, as she said, and started having little jobs and whatever she, you know, earned, she brought back. My sister was not very well, but she kept her. And I, as a Polish child, had to go to school for two hours a day. And I was very anxious about going to church because I didn't know anything about the Catholic religion didn't know anything about my own, but let alone the Catholic. So um, uh, all I knew was to cross myself going in and out of church. That's all That's I important. knew. That's important. Yeah. So I went to school, and the first thing I learned was that one hour was for religion and one hour was for general 
studies, whatever. You know, the children were not very, uh, not very educated. I, obviously, during the war, there wasn't much schooling at all. Um, but they, uh, I was glad that there was a religion class because, uh, I, as I said, I was hoping to learn a little bit something. And sure enough, they taught a Catholic religion with the catechism. It was a little booklet, and you had questions and answers. And I got hold of that booklet, and I was able to read it up from top to bottom and side to side, and I got some idea, you know, about what, <coughs> what the religion is about. <coughs> Excuse me. So I was feeling much better about it because, we, you know, we had to be every Sunday we went to to church, and uh, my, the lady who looked after was very keen on me, saving my soul, which I gave her all the credit for. She sent me for classes to be, <clears throat> sorry. Just, sure, take a sip. Your father teaching you to read at such a young age really paid off. It was really helpful for you. Absolutely. <coughs> so, um, just, losing my voice, it's not good. So I learned as much as I could from that, and I went to communion. There's one picture there is, I'm going to communion. And my mother went from work to job to job, finding various things. She was very worried about security. <clears throat> Still not good. I am very worried about the security, and particularly she was worried about my sister, and not only that she was not well, but she had very curly hair. And the Polish girls at that time, there were very little, there were very few mixtures there. It was all Polish, you know, and Ukrainian, all blonde. So they all had blonde, straight blonde hair. Mine was blonde and wavy, so they braided it, but hers was just like an afro. So she was terribly worried that she was playing on the street and then, you know, Somebody would point, it was enough to point, you know, and, and that was enough. So she shaved my sister off completely a couple of times. Shaved it all off? Yes, poor thing. You How know. old was she at that time? She was about two and a half, maybe. About two and a half. Yeah, two, two wow. and a half, yes. Very, very young. And um, so that was one thing she did. Then, then she was thinking that, you know, the Polish people were very good at recognizing Jews. So she was worried about that. So she sort of offered herself for a job in Germany. And um, the Polish people, a lot of Polish people went, did that. And that was uh, OK, because the Polish people were supposed to be the slave labor, you know. And so they, they could go and work and earn money, I guess. And so my mother thought it would be safer if she went to Germany and took for work. But they didn't take us because my sister was too young. So that didn't work out. I think it's a, it's a, it was a good idea, but very yes, brave. Exactly. As we said earlier, your mother was so brave yeah. and had such foresight. She even thought of putting my sister up for adoption for a moment there, but there was only a moment and she just decided. But in that situation, I guess yes. she had to think of everything, everything consider everything. Yes, everything, yeah. yeah. So um, in the meantime, we've, we got one letter from the people we left behind. Um, they uh, knew, must, my mother must have written to them because they knew where we were. And they said in the letter that my father had sent a letter through the Red Cross that he was in Palestine with his sister. We knew there was, uh, the, his sister went out with uh, the children in 1932, and they went to work the land in, in Palestine in those days. We never met that part of the family, but we knew that if he was in Palestine, he was out of Russia, and he was not a prisoner anymore. We couldn't do anything about it because obviously we couldn't contact him, but we at least had this good news that he was not a prisoner anymore. And then my mother, as you saw there, she decided that what she needed was an uh, um, ID card that she's working for the Germans. It was very important. The Germans stopped you and you had the papers that you're working for the Germans, for the Polish people, that is. That was okay. So um, she, that, that's when she decided to apply for this job in the German military camp. And uh, it was risky, again, because they asked for the papers. 
and they had to, you know, there were no computers in those days, so it wasn't as easy to click in and, you know, to find out. But still, they, they took weeks, and we, we, we didn't know whether we were going to be taken out and arrested immediately or not. But in the end, the job came through, and she got this big job, which was peeling potatoes for the troops. And, but, and that additional um, worker ID Yes. It was additional protection. Exactly, she had the protection. And sure enough, not very long afterwards, we suddenly got a raid from the Germans in the middle of the night. They came with guns drawn in the middle of the night, rouse, rouse everybody out. So we all came out, my mother got up and uh, shows her eyes, Ausweis, the ID card. And he said, no, no, you stay. So we the only Jews. <laughs> We, we stayed. They took the rest of the people there to the station to be checked out. They all came back the next morning because they were all working. But we had, you know, we were spared to be in the Gestapo station. Because of that special Because of card. that special card. So the only Jews in the house. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, yeah. So that was one of She was brave. <laughs> and she was correct. Yeah, that was my mother. Yeah. yeah. Yes. In the meantime, Food was very, very uh, rare and very little. Uh, we kids used to try and, and, and steal as much as we could. That was a, somebody asked me what was my hobby, so I said stealing food. <laughs> <laughs> that was my hobby. And we used to go to our people's orchards in the summer. We used to you know, grab some fruit. And mainly uh, the food we took from the farmers. The farmers had to bring certain contingents in um, and then they had to weigh them in, you know, they had to bring it to the, to the Germans and they would be weighed in, then, then they had to deliver it to wherever they had to. But in the meantime, if they had been stamped as being okay, that they had enough stuff, so we could just jump in the back of the carts and we would just grab potatoes, carrots, whatever, you know, remember take my skirt up and, you know, and then we had little food. So we could make a soup or something, and uh, as I said, we didn't see any meat for years, and uh, bread, no bread. So that was just, we had barley, for some reason they had barley, which was something I didn't like even as a child, so I did not <laughs> enjoy that. I must have starved a bit. There was no obesity at all in those days. <laughs> so we had, you know, wooden clogs, and we used to put old newspapers to keep our feet warm. Um, we had no electricity, no plumbing. We had carboid light. I don't know if you know what a carboid light is, but that's what we used to uh, use a little bit at night. We had that. So living was rather rough. Today, I don't think we could do that. <laughs> but uh, that, you know, we, all we wanted was obviously to, is to live. So um, that went on for, my mother worked for quite a while at this German uh, military camp, and one morning we woke up and it was quiet. It was complete loud silence on the street. No, no car, uh, horse and carts, nothing. And we, my mother was in bed with my sister, and I was standing by the window at the end of the bed, and we were talking, she didn't know whether she should go to work or not. She didn't know, we didn't have any newspapers or radios. We had no idea what was going on in the front. And suddenly there was a tremendous bang and uh, apparently it was a bomb that came down. The only bomb that came down, that was that, that was on our house. Came split, right on your house. It split and, up and, and hit my hand. A shrapnel hit my hand and I started screaming, my hand, my hand, my mother grabbed me and, and grabbed my sister and we walked out onto the street. Uh, my, my, my hand was bleeding badly, she looked around, there was, she was carrying my sister so we had to walk. There was a hospital not too far away, we walked to the hospital. They picked me up and they cleaned me out and, um, and told the, that the Russians were coming. They uh, told her that um, my hand may have to be amputated because there was uh, lots of dirt, you know, the, from the, the way the dirt came down. Um, in the end, the nurses were very good. They were, they were nuns, 
Yeah. You two beautiful nuns. And uh, they managed to clean me. They had to, they had to use very um, bad medicine. What was it that you, you burn the, the bad stuff? Uh, the, the cauterize? Yes, cauterize, yes. They had cauterize. to cauterize my hand. And uh, my mother ran for, uh, for, for, for miles just not to hear me scream. And, uh, and the nun would say to me, just put your face in, the, in, in my habit and scream. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> so. So, but they saved my hand, okay, so I lost a finger and a, and a half, so that was that. And my mother, in the meantime, immediately started thinking of, uh, for the, you know, to find my father. She knew that he didn't know where we were, so we, everybody started looking for people. So she knitted a little bit for, to, to earn some money, and then she started putting out announcements. Now, she knew they were in Palestine, but she didn't even know it was Haifa or Tel Aviv. Uh, so she put out various announcements. Uh, she, uh, after she spent one night with me and my sister in the hospital, she went back to the place we lived in. It was completely ruined. There was nothing there, nothing, nothing to, to, to save. So the neighbor took her. And uh, we found out that in the kitchen, the roof fell down. You see, I was next door. I was in the bedroom, and this kitchen fell down. And unfortunately, sadly, the lady who took us in was killed. She was under the, under, under the, under the deck. So, so, my, that's, so my mother went back and forth to the hospital to me. And uh, in the meantime, the doctor diagnosed her with uh, cancer breast cancer. So there still while you were in the hospital she was diagnosed. Yes, yes. Oh my yeah. Gosh. yeah. Um, at once. And uh, so they they suggested she has the operation because they didn't want us to be orphans. So she did that. And so my mother did and uh, the lady next door took care of my sister in the meantime. I I wanted to say my real name in the hospital, but my mother said that I couldn't because there was a pogrom and the few Jewish people that came out of hiding were killed by the Poles. Now I know not all the Poles are bad and I know there were ones that helped, but still that was, that was a fact. So I had to keep my, I had to keep pretending to be and the false names until we got to Krakow. But that, uh, that's like, how are we doing for time? A little okay. bit more time. Okay, so um, m my father was found and my father sent my cousin from uh, Palestine because he was in the British Army, he had the uniform, so uh, times were so mixed. You, the Russians were coming and the, everything was a bit of a mess and people could move around. So he came and he was uh, no problem, you know, crossing the borders or anything. And he came and uh, he, he put us in touch with the Jewish agency in Krakow. And so we had to make our way to Krakow. Um, and then we were in a kind of communal home. And uh, from there, they took us to Szczecin, so Staten. And from there, they put us over to Germany over the, 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 the frontier. There was a Polish and a, and a, and a Russian guard there. And um, the Polish guard was fine. We to give him vodka and, you know, and, and was fine. But the Russian guard was not satisfied. So he insisted on, on a chassé. He wanted a watch. So nobody moved until my mother moved. My mother gave her watch, so then, they, uh, some other people there, because the Russians used to have a jacket and used to have full of watches here. That's, they, they, loved, they loved watches. So once we were over the border into Germany, we had to make our way to Berlin, and we had to buy tickets. And you wouldn't believe it, but the Germans refused to sell us tickets because we were Jews. That was, yeah, yes, yes, I, I mean. By then we were under the auspices of the Jewish Agency, so I don't know how they bought them anyway, but that's just never forgot that. Before you go any further from Germany, yes. um, I recall part of what you explained about 
when you were talking about anti-Semitism and lingering yes. anti-Semitism and these fears, that your sister's reaction to learning she was Jewish was peculiar. Oh yes, that's, that was another peculiar, thing, yes. Yeah. When she saw my cousin, she said to him, Ari, you're a nice man, but you're Jewish. <laughs> so, so he said, well, yes, but so are you. And she said, no. She said, look at me. Do I have horns? Do I have a tail? Because that's the way she understood the Jews look like. So, because of growing up as a little girl and yes, she had, posing she as a Polish very, girl. She was not happy. Oh, it took her a while. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> yes. yes, but she was very young. She was five. And of they course. used to apparently ask her, catch her somewhere in the, in, the, in the garden, and they would say, yeah, you can tell us now, right? You, you, you're Jewish. No. No, of course not. So, but that was part of your mom's strategy to keep yeah, her yeah. Well, innocent of, of what was of going on. So it yes. worked. Yes. But so, yes. Back to, we have a few more. Back to Germany. Back to Germany and yeah, from back where? To where Germany. From okay, so we went through the German various, in Berlin, in various uh, parts of Germany. What was it? Berlin was in, uh, divided up. So we went to the French zone. We got wonderful cheese. And then we went to the English and we got very good bread. I had not seen that for a long time. I know, I was delighted. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, we did not manage to catch up with my father for a, a couple of months. We ended up in a, in a DP camp in Italy. Um, my father turned out to have been in, in, the, in the army. Uh, what happened was that they had a uh, nice uh, meeting in Yalta, the uh, Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt, and they, uh, the Stalin agreed to let some people out, the political prisoners, because they needed boots on the ground because they, they had to fight Hitler. They didn't have, they were not doing well. So they decided to let people out. That's how my father came out. And so there was a general, Anders, who uh, was also a political prisoner. He was asked to create a unit of uh, soldiers there, and my father was one of them that joined. And uh, Anders was so nice because he said, I'm not only going to take the men, I'm going to take families as well. And they let him do that. So my aunt and uncle and cousin came out as well. They were in Siberia too. And um, my father then was stationed actually in the Polish unit, which was part of the British army in Egypt. But you know, they're very close, so he would spend his weekends with his sister in, in, in Tel Aviv. But uh, we didn't know any of that. But because he was part of the British army, uh, they had the choice uh, where to go. We didn't have to wait for, you know, to get anywhere. Uh, but they said either Palestine or England, and my parents chose England. So that's why I ended up going to England. And uh, England was very, very cold and rainy, very miserable. They had fought so hard. Mm. They were almost, they were, they were drained, but they were very nice, they were fair. They let us, you know, the, the rations, we had the rations as they did. But it was not an easy life there, but of course we were free and uh, started learning the language there. And eventually we moved to London and everybody bought a house because we wanted, you know, we were homeless for so long and all we wanted was to have a place of our own. Um, my, uh, I went to school and uh, they told me just to get on with it and learn the language. And I read a lot of Polish books and knitted a lot. But eventually the teacher would say to me, well, just do your best, do your best. <laughs> and, it, and you found a hobby that you, uh, yes, not, well, not a hobby, more than a hobby. My hobby was better than the one in the war. Yes, because I was a little frustrated because not knowing the language, I didn't know the culture. So uh, I, I wanted to play tennis, but unfortunately there were no facilities. So I took up table tennis, and table ten there were tables everywhere in school, in college, and uh, then I found a, a youth club around where we bought the house, also ten, table tennis. 
And so I played a lot of table tennis and it gave me a lot of pleasure, a lot of exercise. And uh, eventually, um, Israel, when Israel was created, I was able to um, go to Israel as a representing England in table tennis. They have what's called the Maccabea Games every four years, just like the Olympics, but they were for Jewish youth from all over the world. It continues today as well. And so in 1953, I was sent to represent uh, England in, nine, in, in table tennis. And I met my family there for the first time and a couple of friends that settled in Israel. And it was the most wonderful trip that I can remember. And uh, I had to go back home because my mother was not well. So I went back, but I promised myself that I will go back again. And um, my mother, unfortunately, got cancer again and passed away in 1956. And in 1957 was another Maccabea, so I went again. And uh, this time I said I'd stay a year if, if I could find a job in English. And uh, because it was under the British mandate, it wasn't difficult. So I stayed there and uh, I decided to bring my sister over and she came to a kibbutz for a year. Uh, she met her future husband there, and he was English, so that's why she's in London now. <laughs> and uh, and I, I stayed there, and I had to find another job because the place I was working for it was sold to the Israelis, so I was looking for a job, and my job turned out to be in American Embassy in Tel Aviv, and that's why I ended up eventually in the States. <laughs> yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, Helena. We have time for a few questions from our audience. Yes, absolutely. And after we do questions, please remain seated and listening because Helena will close the program with a few last words. Oh, yes. We have two microphones on stands, one in either aisle here. And so please come to the microphone and wait until you're at the microphone to pose your question. That'll make it easier for us to hear it up here. And I'll repeat your question to make sure that that um, Helena hears it, and if I can ask questioners to be as, as brief as they can be, that would be great too. Do we have any questions? Hello. Thank Hi. you for your story, Helena. Um, I was struck when you said that you, didn't, that you knew the Russians were going to come and get you. What? I was struck when you said that you didn't know what it meant that the Germans were coming next that you hadn't heard, you know, just in social media now, the way we live, knowing everything before it happens. Uh, I was just struck when you said you didn't have the information about what was going to happen when, when you heard the Germans were coming when the Russians left. Yeah. And was there, did you, were there, so were there any newspaper publications about what was going on in other areas, or was it just, um, Propaganda, does that make sense? So, so her question is about yeah. um, the fact that you said that when you knew the Germans were coming, you didn't quite know what that would mean. And so what, what kind of information did you have, or do you know that you're- that I was you're, about that so high. She, she was only six <laughs> years old. And but, all I knew was what, my, what I told, my mother told me, you know, what was going on. They didn't know anything. There were no papers, no radios that was, that was a no-no, so we didn't know anything. We had no idea what they were, you know, they were, the, what the plans were, nothing. We just wanted to cooperate and, and, and live in peace. That's all we wanted to do. Wow, well, thank you again for your story. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Over here, yeah. please. Hello, <clears throat> thank you for being here. Um, my question to you is, during your travels, other than, the time when you had injury to your hand, were you consistently subjected to bombings along the way? So she, she's wondering about um, bombings. Was the bomb that, that fell on your house the only bombing you experienced, or were there other times? No, that's about it. That that's the funny. only bomb, because we were living in an area where you know it was a small town, and I guess the bombings were in big towns. Okay. So we did not. We had an anti-artillery uh, in the hospital. They, they, were, they, had, they were always shooting up there, but 
but uh, we didn't have any other bombs. There was the only bomb that fell on that town at that time. But it was a small town and, and, and the Germans disappeared. So there was not that much to fight about, I expect. I, I don't know. Right. Very difficult to know what happened there. And I have another question too. Oh, go ahead. Uh, is, it brief, is it a quick one? Okay, yeah. Um, you, you said a couple of times that uh, the Germans knew how to, to, what to look for to find the Jews, and the Pol Polish what to look for to find the Jews. What were they looking for? So, so she, actually what Helena Had, said is, is her mom believed that the Poles really knew what to look for to find a Jew yeah, um, appearance, right. and that the Germans less so. But what does that mean? What were they looking for? What might they notice that would well, indicate that you were Jewish? I, I honestly don't know. I tell you, my sister, who was five years old, told my, my, uh, my cousin that she, he was Jewish. I mean, how she knew, I don't know. The Polish people are very good at recognizing Jews. We had some characteristics, I guess. Oh, uh, OK. But you don't know what it's, that it's, was. It's confusing. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. And, and I think one last question. I would like, thank you for your beautiful story. Um, I would like to know if you've ever written a memoir or autobiography that we could purchase. Have you written a memoir or biography to purchase? Have I what? Have you written a memoir or your autobiography? No, I have not. I read, I, I, I'm in a, in a class here that they have, it's uh, Echoes of Memory and I write small, small pieces. Um, I just don't feel, I will, it's too painful. Uh, particularly because of my mother, and uh, it would just be too sad. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your questions. I'm going to turn back to Helena in a moment to close our program. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. As I mentioned, our first person programs take place every Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August. We hope that you can come back. It's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. But before we turn back to Helena, I want to let you know two things. First, for those who didn't get to ask a question to Helena during the, the normal program period, she'll remain on stage after the program so that you could come down and ask her then, or maybe take a photograph. The second thing, and this is important, our photographer, Joel, is here with us in the front row. He's going to come up on stage after Helena finishes her closing remarks. And Joel will take a photo of Helena with all of you in the background. It makes for a really great photo, but we have to ask that you stay in your seats. So if you just remember that, I, um, I'll turn back to Helena for the last word. Yes, that is the most difficult part. I, uh, I like to bear witness to what happened to me, and uh, because a lot of uh, people still don't think that it really happened. And I think it's so important to learn from history, which we hope will never repeat itself. And uh, I feel like there is a saying in Hebrew, tikkun olam, which means repairing the world. I think we all have to work for that. And I'm hoping that it will never happen again. But as I said, it takes hard work and cooperation, and uh, we should all help each other and do the best we can for each other. And I think that it's the only way the, the, world, the world will become better. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you.